I think the, the nice guidelines for treatment of type 2 diabetes can be conveniently split into four steps. And although the eventual guideline had a very complicated treatment diagram, which to me looks a little bit like a tube station map, um, in the draft guidance um, that came out from NICE, there's quite a, a nice sort of uh, stepped algorithm that goes through things in a, a much easier detail. And I think that's probably still worth referring back to. The first step is diagnosis, and NICE uses the an HbA1c uh, diagnostic cutoff of 6.5% for type 2 diabetes. Now, this is something that has now been adopted within the uh, US, and WHO are also recommending that HbA1c can be used as a diagnostic tool, although in the UK there's still a prevarication. Um, and I know that a lot of practitioners now are using HbA1c as a diagnostic but I think the difficulty comes in trying to work out where pre-diabetes stands. So whereas at the moment we have fasting uh, glycemic levels that are known as impaired fasting glucose and we've got the glucose tolerance data that gives you impaired glucose tolerance, nobody's quite sure what levels of HbA1c should be regarded as, and I think the term is impaired um, glucose uh, regulation. So another term uh, to grapple with. At the point of diagnosis, uh, NICE would recommend treatment with metformin, but after a period of lifestyle and diet intervention. And this contrasts with the American view that metformin would be uh, started immediately. There is an alternative to metformin as first line uh, in the NICE guideline, and that would be use of sulfonylureas. The second uh, step in NICE treatment for uh, type 2 diabetes uh, would be the addition of further medication to the baseline metformin and the default position for NICE would be the addition of a sulfonylurea. There are however alternatives to sulfonylureas and that would be uh, currently pioglitazone as a TZD and the glyptin, so cytogliptin, saxagliptin, linogliptin and vildagliptin. Now the reasons that these other agents might be used in preference to a sulfonylurea relate to issues around weight gain and hypoglycemia. So in patients in whom hypoglycemia is deemed a significant risk, either of the classes of agents, both pyoglitazone and the glyptins, would be preferred since neither has a high risk of hypoglycemia, either alone or in combination with metformin. The issues around weight are a little more complex in that pyoglitazone will tend to lead to weight gain, and this is uh, predominantly down to either fluid retention or a redistribution of fat, whereas the uh, gliptins are typically weight neutral in this context. There's also a caveat that pyoglitazone might be used in patients who are particularly insulin resistant. However, in normal clinical practice, insulin resistance is not measured, and it's assumed on the basis typically of body fat. So this would be a patient who would typically be centrally obese, and at that point then obesity becomes also an indication for looking at the glyptins. Once we get to third-line therapy <coughs> for NICE, uh, it's rather more complicated in that there are four possible defaults and other alternatives. So NICE would promote the early use of insulin, typically animal insulin, in addition to the uh, previous treatments, so typically metformin and sulfonylurea. In those patients who are unable to achieve control, and at this point NICE is regarding an HbA1c of 7.5% as a target for control, then one might consider analog insulins. And the basis here really is down to the, the analog insulins being more expensive than human insulins. There's also the option of using additional tablets. So pyoglitazone, for example, could be used in triple therapy with the addition onto metformin and sulfonylurea, and the same applies to the gliptins. I think at the moment that it's just cytogliptin and linogliptin that have got triple therapy licenses, but ultimately one would expect that any of the gliptins would be available for this indication. And again, the target at this point would be a HbA1c of 7.5%. NICE includes a small section on ACABOs as a potential add-in, but I must say this is a preparation that's uh, uncommonly used in the UK. It 
down to its side effects, which basically um, revolve around bowel wind, which people in the UK find difficult to uh, cope with, although in interestingly, it remains a, a commonly used and popular agent within Germany. At third line therapy, there's also the option of the newer injectable treatments. So these are the GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, which previously was Bieta, which is exenatide, or Victoza, which is liraglutide, and most recently the option of once weekly exenatide, which is known as Bigurion. Now, the two former agents have got nice approval. Um, Exenatide as Bieta was included in the NICE guideline from 2009, whereas liraglutide went through what's called a single technology appraisal, which is a sort of bolt-on guideline uh, procedure which Bigurion is currently uh, undergoing. The first two GLP-1 receptor agonists are recommended for consideration in those patients who have got a body mass index above 35 kilograms per meter squared. And this is largely based on the cost of these agents versus an equivalent dose of uh, analog insulin in patients who have that body weight. Um, the other caveats that allow the use of these agents are a lower body mass index for those who have got significant comorbidities that might be affected by weight gain. So that would be such things as uh, sleep apnea where that certainly would be an issue. And then for certain ethnic groups where the BMI should be corrected downwards. So uh, Asian background patients, for example, would have a, a lower BMI threshold. There's also the caveat that those people who might be uh, come under difficulty with their employment could also be considered at a lower level and these would be people like taxi drivers where insulin may be uh, an obstacle to their continuing uh, in their job. There are also uh, issues around responder phenotype for the GLP-1 receptor agonists and basically NICE is requiring certain outcomes at six months to enable a prescription to be continued. And for the current NICE guideline, they're suggesting a 1% reduction in HbA1c and a 3% reduction in body weight at six months after initiation. Otherwise, the recommendation is that these drugs would be withheld. There are also stopping rules for the gliptins, and those have also extended to pioglitazone. So previously, the TZDs didn't have stopping rules apply, but now they do. These are less uh, rigid than for the GLP-1 injectables in that the HbA1c fall that's required is 0.5% over six months and there are no caveats regarding weight. The fourth line therapy, uh, step therapy for uh, treatment of type 2 diabetes according uh, to NICE is now looking at intensification of insulin regimes and this would typically involve either fixed mixture insulin regimes or intensification of a basal insulin using prandial insulin. And this is often where analog short-acting insulins come into, uh, come into practice. And at this point, I think most clinicians would be beginning to withdraw oral therapies, although many of the treatments are now licensed for use with insulin. So for example, metformin would commonly be used, sulfonylureas are licensed for use with insulin, as are some of the gliptins. But I think for, for most uh, clinicians, it would be a case of continuing metformin but withdrawing the other oral agents as the insulin, insulin intensification regimes were introduced.